Aloha nui kako, and welcome to Ho'ola Week of Hawaiian History Month, a series that features Hawaiian health and well being through the lens of history. Hawaiian History Month is presented proudly by Hawaii Pono'i Coalition. And this new season is presented with the support of many sp sponsors and many partners. Tonight's episode is entitled Hey Lala Ulu, Lahui Empowerment Through Cultural Practices of Hapai and Hanau. Oh, <laughs> hey Lala Ulu, Maoli traditions of pregnancy and childbirth can influence the development of a strong Lahui. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed and will be archived on the Hawaiian History Month website. And we welcome your questions uh, in the question and answer panel at the bottom of your Zoom, if you're watching through Zoom, or you can put your questions or comments in the comment field if you're viewing this on Facebook. Mahalo to all of our cross post partners. Hey, la la ulu. My name is Kim Kuule Burney. I'm with Papa Ola Lokahi, and I'm one of the coordinators, along with Dr. Martina Kamaka, who put together uh, the Ho'ola Week uh, of Hawaiian History Month. We have three presenters tonight. Sharon Kaiolani Odom is the director of the Returning to Our Roots program at Kokua Kalihi Valley that oversees the Roots Cafe and the Food Hub. She's also a Lomi Lomi practitioner a registered dietitian, a public health educator, a hula practitioner, and Kumu, as I recall, and founder of several grassroots cultural-based and place-based programs that serve the greater community. Puni Jackson is the director of Ho'ulu Aina, a 100-acre nature preserve dedicated to cultural education and community transformation that's nestled in the back of Kalihi Valley and cared for by Kokua Kalihi Valley Comprehensive Family Services, a not-for-profit community health center. Puni is a practitioner, an accomplished artist, and founder of several grassroots culture-based and place-based programs. Our third panelist is Wahine Hula Kaeo. She's a Ko'okua, or birth and postpartum doula from Waiohuli, Maui. She's a proud graduate of Kekula Kayapuni o Maui and a former preschool teacher at Punanaleo o Maui. She's co-founder of Kalao o Kekahuli, a nonprofit organization that supports Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander families by providing culturally-based prenatal birth and postpartum education and services. Aloha Kaiu, aloha Puni, aloha Wahine Hula. Aloha. 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 Well, I wanna welcome you here tonight. We've talked before, and I think tonight's gonna to be a really interesting conversation, but I wonder if each of you, I've done the standard bio. I wonder if each of you could tell us a little bit about yourselves and um, where you come from. Uh, so the audience can get to know you a little bit before we start to talk about, um, before we start to get into the meat of the discussion tonight. Who do you want to start with? We'll go youngest to oldest first. Hula, it's you. <laughs> Hiki no. Um, aloha mai kako, uh, o vaokeia, o wahine hula kaeo. Um, aloha kako, my name is wahine hula kaeo. Um, as she shared, I am from Moyo Huli Maui. Um, I have strong roots here on Maui on both sides of my ohana. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in a household where, um, you know, Ike Hawaii and Olalo Hawaii were the main foundations of um, just growing up and being raised by my mokua, uh, which, you know, of course, kind of led into me uh, following this pathway. Um, I've always had an affinity for birth uh, and for, uh, Ike Hawaii surrounding birth from a from a really young age and um now um I am embarking in a journey to become a midwife um or palekiki and so I'm in my second year of midwifery school um which is exciting um and yeah I'm just super passionate about uh really making 
uh, prenatal birth and postpartum care accessible uh, and culturally relevant to our community. Uh, yeah. And you're serving the island of Maui. So we are spreading out these practices to, uh, to all of our islands, hopefully. Uh, Puni. Aloha, wau opuni, um, noho au i kalihi uka nei, uh, waha nei ia bau ma kahi um, kapa ia opu nui, ma nu'u anu. Um, <clears throat> Aloha, my name is Puni. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I'm here in the back of Kalihi Valley. Um, my work has been tied to Aloha Aina and Malama Aina for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and I'm really grateful to be in this context of birthing and uh, birth practice. Um, I've been part of uh, the ho'olele, the, the perpetuation of Native birth practices in my own family and in the community that we serve for the last, I guess, 24 years, um, <laughs> uh, but more actively in the last 15 years with Kokua Kalihi Valley and my, my partner in crime, Ka'iulani Odom. Um, I have five children of my own and Ka'iu likes to use me as a guinea pig for all of the <laughs> reclamation of native practice. Uh, that will be my claim to fame as I go down in history. Uh, but I, I'm, I am really honored um, to have been uh, a voice and a support for many families over these last 15 years, just being able to um, not just talk about the history and, and practice and ike and, uh, of our kupuna, but, but to actually implement and perpetuate and support and resource uh, those practices. Uh, and we've seen <clears throat> such the positive outcome over the, the many generations um, uh, that we hold with us. And, and we're seeing it in not just the young ones that we gave birth to, but here, here we have Wahide Hula with us that is perpetuating um, this uh, this work even um, even in her young generation. So uh, really grateful to be here. Thank you, Kim, for welcoming us. And uh, I'm really uh, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of those Kumu that have taught us and shared their Mo'olelo with us. I hope that I can do the best that I can to share this Mo'olelo tonight. Oh, we're grateful you're here tonight. Um, Ka'iulani, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Aloha o bao o Ka'iolani no ho bao i Mokapu i Kailua. So I'm Ka'iol Odin. I'm, I live in Mokapu um, on the island of Oahu in Kailua. And let's see, I am a dietitian by trade, but really I've been working in indigenous nutrition for most of my career. But Kuni and I met when we were a part of a group of practitioners called Hui Maoliola. And I think that was in 2005 we were just talking about it the other day and and um we as we met all the time as a group of practitioners just trying to to make sure that our healing practices thrive you know the project of birthing um came to us and so we've been doing this for about 15 years and i think but um we laugh because Puni started, I mean, she was having her second set of kids. And so um, everything that we did, I was like, oh, Puni, you have to do this and you have to do this, you're going to do this. And so, um, and she nicely enough had three children for us while we were doing all of this. So <laughs> we had a lot of practice, but I think what's really good is that we got to each use the backgrounds of what we knew. And, you know, while I was in Hula and working with Herbert and, you know, trying, learning about Lomi and La'au and stuff, and Puni had all of her own teachers, that, that, cultural knowledge we got to bring from all the, all of our kumu and we got to bring together when we started doing work with families and keiki and and you know we're we're always learning we're learning along the way but the fact that we got to infuse what we were doing with all these cultural practices and knowledge from the people that we learned from has really um i don't know it just made this pro this work a work of passion something that you know we would we love doing and we're going to continue doing no matter what. Of course you are. Mahalo for sharing your learning, some of your learnings with everybody tonight, um, particularly 
as it's an honor that you have had so many teachers and you can share some of that with us. Um, but while uh, while we're talking to you, cut you, it really uh, I've I've heard some of your presentations and it really goes back to Haumea. Can you talk about how Haumea provides the foundation? And um, and then, you know, and then we'll see where the uh, discussion goes from there. Sure. I mean, the, just the land that Puni lives on and that we work on is the land of Haumea. So it's infused in into everything we do. And if you think about the Mo'olelo that's up there um, and really the way I think of Haumea, is she was like the mother of all mothers, right? And so when we're looking at traditions and we're looking at what we pull from ourselves, we're pulling from Haumea on, on a daily basis. And it also helps to ground us in what are the cultural practices as we empower our couples that, um, what are we teaching them? What are we, you know, pulling from? And, you know, one of the things that we often teach them, and this came from love really is that, as Haumea and a mother, you're going to be birthing all of your generations. And so everything that you do is really important, not just for your child. Sometimes in a Western viewpoint, we do things just for our own health or as a pregnant mom, you're doing it just so that you'll have a healthy child. But if you want to think of a cultural tradition and all the, the many generations that Haumea got to, to bear, then you as a mother, you're not just doing the right thing or eating the right things or saying the right things because you want to have a healthy child. But you're doing this because you are impacting the DNA of all your future generations. And so that's why you do it. And so that viewpoint of the long end-term goal of a healthy Lahui is a lot different from just thinking, oh, I'm just going to have a healthy baby. No, you're going to, you're going to bear healthy generations, and that's what we take from home now. Beautiful. Do either Puni or Hula want to add on to that? Yeah, I could add um, a little more that what Kayu is talking about is something that we, we discuss often, this idea that we are born with all of our eggs in our body and the idea that we are um, we are the descendants of Haumea. I often share with our birthing families that every woman, um, every Hawaiian woman is, is Haumea reborn. And in the Kumulipo, we see that genealogically repeating that, um, you know, Haumea connects again with each new generation. And so this idea that, um, and I actually, uh, I, uh, Kim, I remember being up in the forest here, and it was me and Cami, and I think it was Noi Goodyear, um, Kaupua. We were, we were talking about all of the stories that we had heard about Haumea. But there was this funny shyness that all of us had that we didn't want to, like, okay, I just want to say this one thing, but I don't know, it could or couldn't be right. What about this? And it was this really important moment for me. Um, when when I think of my understanding of Haumea. Because I feel like my, my living and my embodiment, my birthing and my supporting others in birth, I can feel and understand Haumea present in my body, in how I eat, you know, what la'au I'm taking, in her kino lao, and in my perpetuation of that ho'omana. Um, but the complexity of our mo'olelo, and, and I, appropriately so in the context of Hawaiian history, um, there were these really funny sources that were like, okay, so I just want to check. So Haumea and Papahana Moku, same, right? Okay. And then <laughs> and we went through all of the different like ways and different mo'olelo that she was referred to and all of her body forms and all of her names. Um, and just, I mean, we kind of went deep and far and long and wide, but, uh, but just um, for our audience and for maybe working conversation, uh, I like to use the word Haumea and the name Haumea when I'm talking about birth and the mana of Hanau, Hanauna and Hanau, then I use the word Haumea. 
and that that name and then um, Kamehi Kana is the name for Haumea that I use when we're talking about transformation and navigating time and space so uh, body changing moving like you know so Haumea is not just birthing babies we're also birthing ideas and birthing nations we're birthing um, you know uh, movements, we're birthing political advocacy, we're birthing all the things, um, birthing islands, of course. And so when I'm talking about uh, birthing, I use usually use that uh, how man when I'm talking about transformation and the ability for the woman, particularly the manawahine, to take energy and transform and sort of navigate portals, then I, I usually refer to Kamehikana. And because that story of Kamehikana that is specific to Kalihiyukane and Nu'umealani and Uanu, where I was raised, that um, kind of takes us in uh, Haumea's uh, journey and um, that, that of like of transformation. And then in that story, also often in the um, the version that I I am most familiar with, uh, she the 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 Inoa Papa is used often. So Papahana Moku is usually the word, the name that is used for Haumea in in when we're talking about land or when I for me that's you know I'm maybe a categorizer I'm not sure, but when I'm talking about land, then I I use Papahana Moku, and often when we're telling the story of Haumea and all of her journeys as a, you know, in like a body form, we kind of use Papa, just like her human form, we kind of say Papa often. But the three names for me, and, and she has many other uh, names and body forms and journeys and <laughs> and um, adventures. Those three names are, are the three names that I think that maybe most Hawaiians should uh, could feel comfortable to use interchangeably or in like how I have those sort of um, realms, you know, so uh, uh, birthing, transformation and land. I love that. I particularly love the way you have just provided a whole audience with reassurance that <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> if you're not sure, now you are, right? <laughs> and here's how you can make those distinctions. Yeah, and uh, Wahine Hula, you invoke Haumea in your daily work? Yeah, so um, just as uh, she just said, you know, talking about birth really, I want to use the word holistically, but really holistically as a whole is a very Hawaiian thing, um, as it is you know, the backbone of everything, when we go back into the Kumulipo, the, the Kumulipo Va'akahi, we're already talking about Hana, Okane, Vahine, duality, we're talking about Vale, and then coming back down, trickling back down all the way now to this generation, and we're still relying on the Vale, and uh, we're still invoking that Vale in order to help us know. And so, um, you know, as a birth worker, it's so funny because I see birth in everything. Like we could, I could literally be, I don't know, it could be like the most randomest thing. And then I just, whoever I'm with, I just start like going on a blurb about something about birth. Um, but, you know, from a, from a, from Kuana Ike Hawaii, like that's correct because everything was, you know, and as much as, you know, um, you know, as we know, there's a lot of scientific backing to um, the Kumulipo, like there is just so much um, mana and there's just so much, um, I don't know, I just think that the the use of of Hano um, is, is just so beautiful and so, you know, um, right, I guess, uh, and it just really sets that foundation in that we are related to everything around us um that we are related to Haumea you know we can trace it all the way back into the Kumulipo that we are connected to Po and and we are and we are birthed um from all of these things um and it's so interesting that you know um Okay, Puni is in Kalihi and then I'm here on Maui and um in versions of the Mo'olalo um of Haumea and Muleula um you know, how ia kalamana and um, the la'au of kalau ke kauli ends up here on Maui in Pu'ukumuwehe'e, um, which is somewhere that um, my ohana is deeply connected to here on Maui. And so um, 
you know, and it's, and it's one of those things where it's one of those things where it kind of bothers me that I don't know where Pu'ukumu is. Um, as much as my ohana has connections there and I ask people around, you know, who are living in Waihe'e, my mom went to Waihe'e school, all her siblings were raised in Waihe'e. Um, we come from that side of the island and, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly in that valley like once a week um, and that's where I go to to gather how for lao ho'ohana o keiki he'e. Um, it's just like a constant reminder that um, the reclamation of lots of practices it's hard to do when a lot of um, ike is lost but we're just gonna keep trying like I keep saying like I'm just gonna go trek into the valley one day and you know I don't know if figure out where, what, whatever. Um, and so um, being able to trace, you know, current practices to things that, you know, Tumo Olelo from how many hundreds of years ago. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing, but it's, you know, still a work in progress. Um, but the fact that, you know, we're just implementing it anyways, I think is, is powerful, yeah. And it is a pu'u, so should it be too hard to find, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it must, it'll emerge. It'll surface at the right time. The pu'u will surface at the right time. So you just said um, about reclaiming, about re uh, reviving the cultural practices. What, um, should we start at the beginning? Should we start at hapai? Is there a point that we should start before the hapai phase begins? Um, how can we start this conversation about our traditions, Kanaka traditions around hapai and hanau? Well, I, I have a story. It's a silly story. story. I don't know why I'm feeling a little bit, but I have the funniest story. I was pregnant with my last, um, with my last baby. He's six now, and um, uh, <clears throat> and I'm old. <laughs> I'm too old to be pregnant anymore. This is my last, last one. And so I, she, oh, he was so heavy, and I had this very pendulous um, uh, uh, pregnancy. My opal was very heavy for me. And very late in my pregnancy, I took my, uh, you know, a bunch of us were down. We took all of the, we, we try to take quarterly all the lauhala mats to wash them in the ocean. So we're, there's all the mats in the ocean and I'm going and <laughs> I'm in my bikini. I tell all the young ones, I'm like, avert your eyes. I'm just like this big waddling. And I even had a ko'o ko'o at that time because it was just really a lot for my back. And so I get down to the bottom of the ocean, I mean, of the beach, and I stick my cocoa in the water and I get into the water and I'm like, oh, my baby is floating. And it was just this most delicious relief of finally the baby is not so heavy on my back. Finally, I have this. So I start floating in the ocean and I'm, I'm enjoying um the lightness that the ocean can bring you and my little girl who is three years old at the in this moment she comes next to me and she's floating and she says oh all my eggs are floating <laughs> and so I tell that story because you um you can't start early enough to have the consciousness that you are holding next generations your body is full of our next generation an infant girl child is holding the eggs of your grandchild children when you're nursing her um so this this beautiful idea um of where do we start it actually it just you know it just will circle back around and around and um her name is Pap papa lani moku and um, so it's beautiful to, um, I like to tell that story. That, that's a good place to start, that even a tiny baby will know she's carrying our generations. And that's because you named her Papa Lani. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is her destiny. Yeah. Ka'iyo, I see you. I see you. Thank no, you. I'm just laughing because what I thought of first was all the different Hawaii lona that we got every time Puni was up high. And I think... Um, 
I don't remember the third one, but there was a red bird in the tree. So all of a sudden, Puni was like, after that birth, avoiding all red birds and trees. And then her eye was really, really red. Was that it, Puni? Yeah, for Poppy, my um, my eye became red. Like, oh, it was like embarrassing. Gotta wear glasses kind, real pehu. Yeah. Yeah. And so even the... Um, when we're working with all of our families, the ability to see Ho'ailona and all the different things and all the different ways is something that they're not all used to. But that was one of my early lessons was really the one, the Ho'ailona that Puni was getting when she was a pai. And so how do we get them to really be aware of the environment, be aware of their surroundings, to listen to their kupuna when we're in this like really busy life all the time and taking, taking it slow to, to understand and to really be connected to the environment. And then when you're thinking of when she's talking about the cycle, you know, we're telling our moms that you know, when they're hapai, when they're nursing, that they are creating a desire for whatever they're eating in their children. And if they're creating the right desires, then they're going to desire our cultural foods that will help our cultural farmer that are taking care of the aina. And so it's this, this whole spectrum and this whole genealogy of what you're creating into your children. And then as they keep going and create it in their children, and then they're they're, like I said, supporting the farmers and they're taking care of our aina, that that's our long-term goal, that this cycle continues time and time again in every pregnancy and every family. And that's one of the things that, you know, it may be a high class, but it's that cycle, it's that regenerative cycle of supporting each other that we're really trying to support. That's beautiful. Earlier, you talked about how you were a hui of practitioners who were studying. Um, what, how were you, what were you studying and how were you studying and what led <coughs> to the programming that you have now? You know, what was that, that, that research journey, if you will? Um, I can start and Puni can, can jump in, but it was really through um, the, as Hui Maliola and then uh, the Connie were given the moon calendar as kind of their project and we were giving given birthing because what we had found was that within just a, a generation or two that a lot of our customs had either been lost or, or not been practiced anymore. And it was really because a lot of our, our um, kupuna they wanted to go to the hospitals. You know, this is what colonization does. They wanted to go to the hospitals like the white women and, and have status. And that showed you had status, so you had money. And, and Puni can tell you about her, her interview with the Kupuna. But anyway, so when we got this, we have to start really looking at what's out there. And so we went to the archives. We um, would ask for interviews. I uh, remember, you know, one of fun interview was with Kimo Keolana, and he took us to someone um, out by where he lives, whose mom was a midwife, and she was telling the stories. We, I remember going to Molokai with Herbert, and there was this um, family of sisters that their father was the midwife and every time someone gave birth the hospital would call him and he would take them and they'd, they'd be under the table and they'd be listening to all of the things and and the one thing that they always remembered was that um, the type of fish soup that he would feed everybody and you know, and knowing about the fish, it's because these are the fish that eat limo. And so having the vitamins and minerals and just having to really digest and listen to all of this. And then we used to meet once a month, twice a month in um, mostly Love's living room. And we'd all share what we learned. And, or sometimes we'd have all our books around us. Sometimes we'd have, you know, whatever resources we had come around. Uh, the Bishop Museum archives, there's a bunch of interviews. Um, ones that I use a lot were uh, from a group of women in Hanalei in about the 1930s. And they were talking about all of their custom. And uh, everybody had their different sources, but we'd come back and we'd meet regularly and we'd talk through all of them. And then we just, um, I think we gave a talk somewhere and that's really how the, the classes started because some someone heard us talk and they all of a sudden wanted to do classes. And so not that, and early on we had decided that, oh, we didn't know what we were gonna do with all of this. First we were gonna do like, you know, everybody sees the birth books that have the calendars and you got your notes and you have some information, but it turned into be so much deeper and more than that. And so that's when we, 
we started the classes. Uh, Puni can add to that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the I was I was uh, pregnant and so feeling like I was ready to implement so much of the practices that we had been researching, but I but I'm a kind of unusual person, you know, I, I like live in the forest that, you know, I, I thought that was going to be a, a very rare thing. But what we found was that people, everybody was ready to implement all of the practices, no matter what their birth story was going to be. So that was in the hospital that was in, in their homes, that was like, whatever amount of food that they could practice, whatever la'au was going to be um, accessible. So, um, the research and the implementation were not two separate stages for very long. Um, we, we started the research and then already the, the ono for those mo'olelo was already, um, it was already, you know, pregnant. Like the, the lahui was pregnant with ono <laughs> for all of the mo'olelo that we were we were gathering, and like you said, some of it was archival. We were going through Olelo Hawaii texts. We were um, doing these interviews, and uh, the barriers or the understanding of all of the different Mo'olelo continues. We I still learn about a Mo'olelo that I learned a long time ago because I'm like, oh, that's what that means, you know. So it's this layered understanding, and so it, um, I, I always tell this story about me and Love Chance. We go down to interview these kupuna. We're down at Luna Lilo home. And, um, uh, you know, we're, so we're talking and sharing like, okay, well, we're here. We're doing this project. And we just wanted to, you know, who wants to talk about their birth practices or native practice or laulapa'au maybe when you guys were giving birth. And all of the women were like, absolutely. I was a modern woman and I gave birth at the hospital and I didn't do any of that laulapa'au because that was for backwards, you know, like it was very interesting that their own sort of like way of presenting their birth stories was they were uh, you know defend defensive even and very veiled and wanted to be perceived as progressive um <clears throat> and not Hawaiian but Hawaiian in that generation was was perceived as 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 you know, maybe shameful but as we got to know and kind, kind of start talking stories I remember this one auntie it was so funny I'm like auntie what is that thing on the top of the baby's head? You know, the, uh, what is that called? The fontanelle? Oh, that's the pico po. And when the baby's born, you got to take the popola and you smash them up and you put them over there. And then, you know, and so she's explained the very same woman who said she never practiced any laulapa'o. And so it was interesting because um, maybe she didn't see that as laulapa'o. Maybe there was some safety in telling the story a different way or a different time, but it made me really aware that all of our stories, um, and actually this is really applicable. I love all of this. Um, Aloha everybody from Waihe'e to Manana, everybody on the, the chat. Um, <clears throat> it made me really aware that everybody's story is a, every Hawaiian person's story is a Hawaiian story. And so you have this idea that is this like ancient Pukui had wrote them down. And so that's the ancient story. But th those stories are connected to our everyday stories. Um, and the auntie who didn't think she practiced laulapa'au, <laughs> but felt like you were really a bad mother if you didn't pack the <laughs> pico po'o with uh, popolo. Um, she, her story was a, a reclaimed story. She was starting to hear her story a different way. And I think everybody needs that. You know, like every Hawaiian should, if you have, if your mother is still alive or if any family member in your family is still around that you can ask about your birth, go and ask about your birth. And sometimes they immediately, they're like, I don't know, I don't remember, it wasn't there, blah, blah, blah. but then if you, if, as you talk stories, you're like, oh yeah, I remember because all those red fish came into the bay when you were born. I remember that, you know? And so there, then you start to see that we're paying attention in a different way that the Ho'ailona are there. Oh, and the reason why you have that name is because of this. Oh, your Ieve is planted over here because auntie said blah, blah, blah. You know, so those stories are, those are important Hawaiian stories, especially for your own family, especially for your own children. But we need to sort of liberate ourselves into telling our own histories, into understanding that our own stories as Hawaiians are Hawaiian stories. 
um, and I've, it's really fun. Um, you know, we have this class where families come through. It's really fun because you'll have families say, oh, I don't know. I wasn't raised really Hawaiian. I didn't, you know, but as we start to like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, everybody who's born uh, had give birth. We have to eat this certain soup uh, or, you know, or yeah, no, all the ieve are planted over here. Or I didn't know what my grandma was doing after she gave birth. She would always make emu. I guess that was the ma vai vai. I never realized, you know, so that was the, the, it just takes us to share those stories across so that we can um, kind of get grounded back into our own identity. And the reason why we do it and not because it's, in, you know, I mean, it's nice to know all the stories. Not everybody needs to know all the stories. Everybody needs to take accountability for the mana that you carry. That's why you need to share the story so that you have the capacity to carry and perpetuate the mana that you're responsible for. And I think in addition, the listening. So, you know, sometimes Hawaiians and, and I, I can think of two examples, two really strong examples that kind of replicate what you just described in areas other than birth, where they say, oh, I don't know anything. Oh, but you know, uncle, you know, so and so did this or that. I mean, how many times have you heard that happen? Um, and I think it's just a matter of listening. Like we might say, oh, did you practice la au la pa'au? No, I didn't. But then if you just talk story long enough, they'll describe a practice that would fit into the category of la au la pa'au, just that they're not categorizing it. So we listen long enough. Um, Wahine Hula, you told us earlier, well, we know about you, that you have been raised um, really in the culture uh, with, by knowledge seekers uh, and practitioners. And um, what kind of, uh, you know, and, and you're young. So all these things that cut you and Puni, you know, they sat down and met monthly and, you know, did their research and dug up in books. You actually have been tracking your whole life. Yeah, so I mean, that's why I always say, you know, I'm like, kind of the product of all of the foundational work that all of they have that they have done um, all of these years. And so, um, you know, because of the people because of them because of the people who have already been doing the work, have I been able to actually, you know, I guess, realize and acknowledge that like there is a place um, for us in the in the birth work field. Um, and so I guess, yeah, I, like I said, I always had this like weird affinity with birth. Um, and, you know, we were they were just talking about Inoa and about Ho'ailona and like all that kinds of stuff. And so people always joke around that because my parents named me a Vahine name, so my name is Vahine Hula, like they, you know, that's why um, now my work is male Vahine. Um, and, I guess kind of going back to kind of piggybacking off of what Anake Puni was just talking about. Um, it's interesting. Um, I'm I'm also very blessed that I have both sets of grandparents that are that are still living, um, and you know, and so I I have them available to talk to me. And it's it's interesting because I think the first time that I heard. Um, a birth story I was like really young and I didn't hear it from my Hawaiian grandpa but I heard it from my um Irish grandma so my my dad is Hapa so his his dad is my 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 papa is Hawaiian um and then my tutu is is Haole from England and um my papa's ohana comes from Hana my papa was born there um all his kupuna come from there and I remember being in Hana um, sitting around the table with my papa and some of his siblings and then my grandma um, and she started talking about um, my papa's older brother's birth story um, and it was a you know it was like a really crazy um, pregnancy and um, you know and they they didn't think he was gonna make it and um, it was because of my of his parents they basically sent him home like oh you know, after he was born, like they sent him home to to Hala with his ohana, and um, it was through like my my grandparents, my great grandparents, Lomi, and um, how they you know they fed him and and how they how they bathed him and and all their pule that you know he was alive and well, and so um, that was sort of my first initial 
I guess, contact with, um, with, with birthing practices and even within my own ohana. Um, and, you know, like, and we we're like, we were talking about, um, you know, just like shame surrounding different cultural aspects and, and people not even realizing that they are um, continuing those practices. And so for my grandma, you know, who is um, from Enelani, um, she is like a huge, huge, huge supporter of Mea Hawaii and, and things like that. And so she's the one that like makes sure that like I know um, I know those things. And it's interesting because she talks about how, um, you know, she was really young when she came here and married my papa and she didn't really know anything. And so her mother-in-law was was basically her mom. And um, so she talks about like the way that she she took care of her postpartum and the way that she taught her how to hanai keiki. And, you know, she even told my tutu things that she would never tell my papa or that my papa would never share with us. And so in that way, I'm like, I'm lucky <laughs> that I have, you know, that I have um, her in that capacity. And it's like a really, you know, interesting dynamic. And so um, that's really like where my, I think my interest like sparked. I was also, you know, my, on my mom's side, my grandpa's a, a taro farmer and um, so I grew up, you know, just like running amok <laughs> in a valley. And um, I was just, you know, always drawn to Meakanu. And like, I was like a ga like gatherer. Um, it's like still something that <laughs> my ohana, you know, they tease me about. And so, um, you know, I used to like go up into the valley and come back with like different mea and I would make potions, but you know, that you, and so um, like we were talking about, you know, just like, I it's as much as I as we say like oh we're reclaiming or revitalizing it's it's just it's really just remembering and you know and that's not new ike it's really just remembering what's already in your ev what's already embedded in your dna um because you know maybe just a few generations ago the the practices that were that were you know trying to include into um our birthing space now maybe your kupuna did it you know three four five six seven generations ago um and so yeah i think yeah, um just you know really trying to dig into um your own ohana's practices and then, you know, if that's not available to you, then geographically, if you know where your ohana comes from, what are the practices in that area? And so a lot of it is, you know, just like self work, I guess you could say, like mo'okuauho, you know, is not just important for like our next generation. So when, you know, we hana, we're presenting this new mo'okuauho, but it's important for us to, to, realize the continuum from from generations ago if that makes sense yeah it's so important you know you touched on a really interesting thing i find in doing genealogy it's often the in-law that is the keeper of so much information you know and if you have access they might not be the direct ancestor or the direct descendant but because they've sat at the feet of whatever kupuna they had access to such as your grandmother um that everybody is a resource so i i see that quite a bit but um mahalo for for sharing some of your stories i think that um well, I think that it's really important and mahalo to all of you for sharing your research journeys and, you know, your how you have acquired some of this knowledge. I think that many in our audience want to know, want to know a few more specifics about um, what some of those practices are. And I know there's no right practice or wrong practice, but there simply were traditions within families, or as you said, hula uh, in communities, you know, geographic communities or however else they might be shaped. Um, I know some of the things that you folks talk about in the class, Puni and Kayu, are uh, nutrition is one topic. What are the different practices that are inherited from our traditions that you have revived or remembered or that you continue to practice? Uh, La'au, Lapa'au is another one. And, and I'm not asking for recipes, but um, 
<laughs> but what uh, you know, what are some of those traditions like packing the pico po'o there? Can you tell us some some of the specifics? I sure. Uh, I can start, and could you? Or you want to go first? Could you? <laughs> go ahead. So, so funny. Okay. Um, I I think I, I think about some of the kupuna that were interviewed early in our research and just to go to the spirit of what was shared, I think that is probably really important. Um, some practices, very specific practices that I've just recently realized are not um, sort of commonly practiced in Hawaiian families anymore. Uh, some have to do with aloha have to do with uh, that sort of protective, the palit, making protected that uh, pregnant person. So when a family member is expecting, then that wahine um, hapai holds so much importance and so much mana that I remember, um, you know, the story of Uncle, um, Uncle Eddie Ka'anana, always saying that it, you know the pregnant woman she has to eat first when the big paina is that it's very important that the pregnant woman eats first and just this is like tiny little thing and then i remember um in some of our interviews that uh you want to make sure and this was a common thing and almost everything that we read or or spoke of that no negativity should be around the the pregnant woman that you want to reduce stress you want to reduce any sort of like bickering or hooky hooky or gossip or um, any sort of negativity. You want that uh, a pregnancy, a new baby coming to this world. It's our tradition to protect that that child from any sort of um, negativity, and um, so much so that uh, you know, if there's something, any sort of problem or issue, then it's the family member's responsibility to protect that, that, that um, you know, that pregnancy by attending to whatever negative issue, or if there's ho'oponopono that is needed, or if there's something that needs, you know, that nothing should come, should enter the realm or that sort of intimate space of the baby that is expected. Um, and Nowadays, the stress of being pregnant or moving or working or working and nursing and being pregnant or whatever, uh, we, we're, you know, the capitalist approach to life means that you just have to like, keep on going, like keep on, you know, getting, getting things done. And I, I we've met many, many women over the, over the years who are sort of like, want that, you know, the, I always call them the A plus girls, you know, they, they want the they want the A plus. They're gonna get everything done, everything organized. They're on Pinterest, making the baby room look like a certain way, and that's just like an intensity of, of gathering more and more and more stress. That is not a cultural thing, you know. That is that's moving away from uh, the cultural practice of all of the family coming around that that pregnancy to make sure that baby is born into love. Um, that the opu is so important that the that you know we were told that um, a couple should be making love often during pregnancy, making love often so that the baby knows the father, knows the family, you know that partner um, to be when baby is born that that even the scent of the partner is familiar, the sound of the baby of of the partner in. Um, should be some music around the baby, exposing the opu, the physical opu, uh, to the elements. So rain and sun and wind that we're not, I think sometimes we get like, I, I know I've read in all of the pregnancy books that you should read to your baby. So, you know, I know that people read <laughs> to their baby. Um, but more than that, the Hawaiian approach is that, yeah, your baby should know a story and your baby should know her family members, your baby should know the ocean, your baby should know your own chanting voice, your baby should be exposed to all of those things that hold the, the safety and the mana and the aloha of the world that the baby is entering into. Um, and so it's a little bit of a recipe, I, I guess, but it's, it's, um, it comes down to 
a practice of aloha, a practice of pale, a practice of being cognizant and intentional about mana. Um, and that was from many, many different people. It was something common throughout, even during pregnancy that um, you're carefully paying attention and it's the responsibility of all of our ohana to give, uh, to tell the dreams. I had this dream, I, you know, and we're paying attention to the, you know, every, every family has the good dreamer, you know, the strong dreamer. So you're paying attention to the dreams, not only of the, the, of the mother or the, the pregnant family member, um, but you're actually paying, paying attention to the dreams of all of those family members um, who, who are attentive or are intended to, to form this baby's uh, future. Um, also the intentionality with which all foods and medicines and prayers are given before pregnancy, during conception, <laughs> and during the pregnancy and during the labor and birth. And then also in those. So um, I think maybe in a Western sense, we see pregnancy as a very specific period of time, um, but in a Hawaiian mindset, and especially uh, Ka'iu talked about how we had this dream of making a, a calendar and it was gonna be like, what trimester is what? <laughs> because uh, the sense of time is different for Hawaiians, just like our sense of mastery is with children. You know, we tell how old they are based on their mastery. It's the same with the babies, you know, that you're, you're becoming pregnant leading up to the moment of conception is as important to the forming of that child um, in, in the Hawaiian worldview. And so if you're making love often and you're in a beautiful space and your relationship is, is grounded and your body is always attended to, you have lomi lomi, you're eating from the land, that's all part of the recipe that is making this child. That's beautiful. That's just beautiful. I remember when I was hapai, my mother-in-law, who is half Hawaiian and half Portuguese, <laughs> um, I, I didn't know the tradition yet. I didn't know all their traditions, but apparently every Christmas Eve, no, every New Year's Eve, she made vinga doish, but nobody was allowed to eat it till midnight. And I come walking in the house in the afternoon and you know how you, you, vinegar, right? And your glands start watering and you think, oh my gosh, that smells so, oh no, can I have some, <laughs> right? And she served me and all the rest of the family looked like, Oh, the pregnant woman gets anything she wants, <laughs> right? I didn't know the rules yet, uh, the rules of the family, but um, but I certainly was shown that protective and kind of uh, mm -hmm. pampering, you know, spoiling from uh, from my in laws, you know, even even when I never know the rules. <laughs> okay. Yeah, those were beautiful stories. I I love. Um, uh, and and what are some of the other traditions, either hula or kaiu? Um, well, so we definitely have a a, um, a regular classes that we do. So we go through lomi, we go through laau, we go through aipono, we go through ho'oponopono. But I think what's interesting is as we started, you know, we were trying to find funding for some of these, even our Hawaiian organizations in the way that they measured success of what we were teaching. So really what people were learning was really all by Western standards. Did they go see the doctor in the first three months? Did they do this and that? And what we were trying to get them to do was empower them to use cultural practices. You know, what were they doing? And so these are all the things that we were looking for as we started teaching the classes. And one of the first things that we found is that, you know, like when you said earlier, all Hawaiian births are different, but Many of our, our young ones, they haven't even seen a birth before. So the, when they first come to class, we have a, a slideshow that shows all different types of births, you know, um, in the hospital, at home, in the forest, so that they can start to broaden their minds about what does a birth look like. Because if they've only seen a hospital birth or they've only seen TV where the husband is running around like a wild man when the, you know, the 
lady starts contractions and and trying to gather stuff then you know we're trying to tell them no this is your time to be together as a couple and make love and you know be really quiet and and nice together before you go into birth you know and so we're really also battling the things that western colonization has has shown us to be a natural birth but that being said you know and uh, and puni gave the really nice broad strokes of all the concepts that one of the things in the concept of poly or protecting is that our, our men or our partners are really glad to have a place in the birth. Because a lot of time as you go through a Western birth, it's the woman that goes to the doctor and the doctor really talks to her and she has all the tests being done to her and she has the baby showers and the whole process is focused on the woman. But in our class, we're really able to give the kind of, um, you know, this is your job. You're protecting her. You are the poly for all of these things. And, you know, when she's breastfeeding, this is what your job is. And so really giving him a place in the birth. And what, you know, we found, we've talked about it before, is that we have, um, you know, our, our Connie are, are coming to class. We have like an 80, 90 percent uh, rate of Connie always there in class or partners because we, we've also had some same-sex partners in class but the partners are are there and they really need a place they need to know that they have a place and we've been able to give them that we've been able to give them a cultural you know um, uh, cultural ways to show up for their partner but I, I do want to say that sometimes too we're bringing up stuff like Yeve, like what are the traditions around pranting the Yeve? And you know, we go through that. One of my questions for you tonight. <laughs> well, and you know, Kihei tells a, a wonderful story. Many of our couples that are in class today have no idea what we had to go through 10 or 15 years ago and the fight and struggle that went on to bring home that Yeve. So, you know, he comes into class and he talks about it but we don't have Aina. So many of us don't have Aina anymore. So we're trying to bring back this tradition of planting the Yeve on your Aina and you know everything that goes with it. And then they're saying, but we don't have, we live in an apartment. My family doesn't own land anymore. What are we gonna do? And so we often have to you know, go through that kind of um, things with them as we're trying to bring back the cultural practices in today's world, well, what are some of the things that that we're up against or that we're fighting up against? Um, even Hanai Bayou, I want I can say that a hundred percent of our couples have the intent of breastfeeding when they leave our class, which is a very high practice. But for many of them, they've also, especially for Connie, they've never seen someone breastfeed. It's, you know, now it's it's a little bit more open, but when we started our classes, we would circle up and we'd, you know, have someone breastfeeding and tell them it was okay to look at them, but really emphasize the importance that this is one of the most indigenous things that you can do is breastfeeding your child and, you know, starting them when they do start to eat with poi and, and how do you do that? You know, food's a big thing for us. So teaching them how to bring back their kupuna foods on a daily basis as their hapai. And, you know, as a dietitian, I know that, um, Oftentimes when people have gestational diabetes or when you're working with diabetes, they consider a carbohydrate serving anything with 15 grams of carbohydrates. So a white piece of bread would be the same as a fourth cup of kala, but I know in the body that that doesn't work well. And so even sometimes we get moms that want to beat the gestational diabetes test and we have to teach them you don't need to beat it. You just need to know what's going on with your body and we can help you with our cultural foods. And so getting them to have cultural foods on a daily basis while they're pregnant. But, you know, I started off talking about the successes that are seen from kind of a Western viewpoint, but we see successes all the time. You know, the father that wants to plant the La'au for his community because now he knows, you know, what good it can do or the, the family that wants to plant their, their um, cultural foods because they want their kids to use it or the mom, I always tell the story about the mom that was worried about her daughter, but she came to the Lomi class. And after the class, she, um, as her Pico lined up with her daughters and her unborn grandchild, she just had this overwhelming feeling that everything was gonna be all right. So our measures of success are ones that are really come out of them practicing their cultural traditions. And that's, you know, that's what we're wanting for, for birthing, to turn into, and not just did you go to see your your 
uh, OB and GYN in the first trimester. You know, there's a lots of other ways from a cultural lens where we can find success in, in helping these couples to just empower them to use their cultural practices. That's beautiful. And I, I have many, many more questions, but I see that there are a lot of questions coming in um, on Facebook. So uh, know that I'm going to get to all of your questions, but in between, we want to make sure that we hear from our panelists as well. Let's talk to right now. We've been talking a little bit about the EFA. So let's, um, and we'll start anywhere. Maybe you can start with you, Hula, or any of the three of you. Um, what is the, what are uh, the question is, what is the proper tradition of taking care of the pico or umbilical cord? But let's, um, you know, there is no right or wrong way. So what are some of the traditions that you're aware of, of taking care of the EFA or uh, the umbilical cord? And related to that, have you any mana'o on placenta encapsulation? Um, I guess I could hold um, up. Yeah, again, I don't think that there is a right or wrong way um, to malama your ieve. However, um, and ugh, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Um, so, uh, as I'm saying, like, oh, we're re remembering all of these things and um, it's like this interesting dynamic between indig indigenous birth work and westernized birth work, um, where I see a lot of parallels. However, um, most of the times when, you know, people in the past have viewed, um, okay, wait, before I even answer that question, I guess I'll go back to just, you know, the practice of Kanu Ieve um, and I guess why it's so important. And so um, most of the time there are other, you know, um, there are other traditions with malamaying your Ieve. However, um, yeah, mahalo <laughs> um, le However, the most common, um, I would say, is the the burial or the the planting of Ieve. Um, and from what I was taught, um, is you you bury your Ieve in in a place of significance. Um, and this is either, you know, where your, where your hale is, where, or um, where your family or genealogy comes from. And that is, again, it's, you know, like, like Anike Puni was saying, it's like a circle. And so um, when you're, you're solidifying that connection between um, that keiki and, and that place and, um, and not just, and, you know, and a lot of people, because this is a practice that has been revived, I, not recently, recently, but pretty recently, I, I encounter a lot of moms who feel some sort of like guilt because they don't know where their Ieve came um, is, is, or, you know, whatever happened to it. And so um, the process of, you know, taking it home and, and canoeing it where, where it belongs is a really healing process. And I also remind them that um, it's not just, you know, the Ieve doesn't only belong to the keiki, but it's something that they grew themselves in their own kino. And, and so in, in that way, it's like three generations of healing and we're going back to that continuum, right, of already in infancy, they're already carrying that hua for the next generation. Um, and so... Okay, I guess I'll answer the placenta encapsulation question. I get this question a lot. Um, and like I was starting this spiel, um, I was talking about how there are lots of practices that actually indigenous practices, you know, that end up being scientifically sound, which we already know that, but sometimes it takes a little while for them to realize that. And so a lot of times for me, I look at practices that are really common across lots of indigenous communities and that's how I kind of gauge things um and then of course just what do we do um to my knowledge we do not have a history of ingesting our own placentas to my knowledge I don't know I could be wrong um and and it's actually not a common practice across indigenous communities and so I don't have a thought on whether it's wrong or right you know it's it is your Ieve and so you choose 
what you would like to do with it. Um, but I think as Indigenous people and as Po'e Hawai'i, um, doing what our kupuna did, and then again, like healing that generational gap that we've had across past, the past two generations by replanting our ieve um, is powerful. So yeah. Yeah. Hey, mahalo, mahalo. I know that was two very disparate questions, but you want to add on, Puni or Kayu? Yeah, I would like to add on. Wahinehula, you're so kind and olu olu. <laughs> I will just say, don't encapsulate your placenta if you want to practice Native practice. If you really care about traditional Native Hawaiian practices, do not make placenta capsules. Plant your placenta in the earth. And um, because that's not for you to eat, that's for Papa to eat. And we started our conversation with Haumea and the idea that Papa is feeding all of us and is all of us. And so um, there is a sadness and a loss uh, that we acknowledge that maybe some of our placentas did not make it into the Honua, make it into the earth. But the placenta, one of the words for the placenta is ieve, but another one is honua. That is our first world. This practice is more important than any laulapa'o recipe that I can tell you on Zoom. But um, this idea that our responsibility to make sure that this honua is going to be a safe and powerful place for all of our future generations means that we have a kuleana to kanu our ieve in the earth. And then also, Wahine, you sh share that you don't know of anybody. There is a very rare occasion in Hawaiian families for those who, um, those genealogies who suffered from um, excessive bleeding. So if it was common in a particular genealogy for people to hemorrhage, then after giving birth, they would eat the placenta. And I say, if you're going to eat your placenta, eat it raw, bra. Just handle it. That, that, that's, if that's what you need, it's la'au and you eat it in the moment when you most need it, which is immediately after birth because you're trying to stop um, hemorrhaging. And that is a common practice across the world. Um, other than that, and I can tell you some like mini hacks because um, I've had so many placentas. So one a, a tradition is that we uh, will plant our placenta. We're going to plant the ieve, kanu ieve. Um, and most families, not all families, but most families will plant it with a tree. And it's very common for the tree to be a fruit bearing tree so that uh, you have this constant relationship with that particular aina, with that particular tree and that yeve. And then the baby is like, oh, this is your tree. You're feeding all of the generations to come. So that's kind of the most common. There's some other ones that, that we've learned and oh, through our research and story over time. Some of um, the fisher people, they like to put the yeve inside of the, um, the, the fish pond wall. And so that, that's another practice. Um, and in some ohana, they will plant the ieve under um, a, a pathway or even a gate and the underneath the gate so that you'll never plant anything on top of it, but it's kind of guarding, it becomes the pale as the family comes in and out. And that space is always gonna be remaining open. So these are three different, uh, and then other play, uh, one other uh, is to plant up in the forest um, and, if you have access in your family to learn or ask or remember or tell the story for the uh, practice that is specific to your ohana, that's the one that's going to have the most mana for you. And then um, for um, Kaiu's comment, many of us um, have had uh, periods of time where we didn't have access to aina in a way that we could plant comfortably. And uh, so we kept our ieve in the freezer. I mean, I don't know, out in the world, raise your hand if you have a placenta in the freezer. There's going to be a lot of wahine Hawaii with their placentas in the freezer. <laughs> that's kind of normal. And so we're kind of waiting. I think that's a very new practice. It's not a regular, it's not an ancient practice to freeze the placenta, but it's a newer practice. And it's because like Wahine Hula said, we want to be able to kanu the ieve in a place of significance, a place where the mana of that aina is going to be forever tied, not just to that child, but to that whole genealogy, that whole family. And so that 
I, I, what I want to say about that, and I'm, I'm grateful for this venue to be able to say this, is that, yes, Hawaiians don't own land as much as we did before. And if we go back in time, we didn't own land before that we had relationship to land, that our pilina to aina is more important than our actual um, deed to aina. And so the process, the formula for energy and spiritual prowess and like strength and ola kino for the lahui, all of that is still intact whether or not we own the land. And so if you want to plant your ieve in a place of significance, you have the opportunity and the cultural right to do so. And it's actually a very powerful cultural right. You have the opportunity to enact and to mobilize the mana of your family with the pilina to aina. And many people are, so I, this is a kahea to anybody who owns land, anybody who is a manager of land, anybody who owns public land or manages public land, that if there is ieve that need to get back into the ieve, into the aina, that is a really powerful way that you can put mana back into the lahui. And so the lament that I don't own my land or I live in an apartment, that is a real feeling of disruption and you are not alone. And it is time for us as a Lahui to move to agency and say, we do have access to certain parts of land and we do have cultural rights and indigenous rights to reclaim and remember the places where our Ieve are safe. And then one little mini hack, if you are going to put your ieve in the freezer, once you put the ieve in the freezer, it's really hard to wash it afterwards. So if you are not able to canoe your fresh ieve, and I've had five babies and I live in the forest and it, I only was able to plant one fresh, everybody else had to have a period of time in the freezer. If you can wash it before you freeze it, that's a lot easier because once you freeze it, when you're washing it, then a lot of times it breaks down or it's just crazy because it's frozen or it starts to disintegrate and it's hard to try. It becomes very like it becomes a reliving of the trauma of a non-access. And so one way to have that ceremony, have the highest level of mana when you are ready is to wash the ieve before you freeze it or before you preserve it in whatever way you're going to do that so that in the moment of your ceremony you're not distracted trying to wash something that should have been washed right away beautiful mahalo nui could i just i wanted to add one thing and and yeah. one of the reasons people are taking the placentas because they hear that it gives you strength it brings your blood back and stuff and it's like the others have said it's just not our culture, but what we do have in our culture is a lot la'au for that for afterbirth, and that it's um, something we've learned from um, someone from Niihau, and that we practice with our families as they give birth. The thing is, is that um, they have to be part of the practice, and they need to help to collect some of the items that will go into the la'au, and it's made the third day after you know the woman gives birth, and there's a little bit of preparation, and um, you know not just physical preparation, but in your mind too, to do this. So not all of the families are able to do it, but for those that do, you know, they show up on the third day after and this la'au does all the things people are looking for when they're encapsulating placentas. And so what we're giving them through these classes is ability to use your own cultural practice. So we don't need to be encapsulating placentas. And so we, we need to look into our own culture for what we need, not into another culture that um, is something that's really just more modern and, and not something that uh, we did unless it was special circumstances. Good point, Kaiyu. Um, one of our questions, I'll stay with you, uh, Kaiyu. Why do we, when the baby is born, why do we say, oh, so pupuka? Yeah, I was reading some of these comments and I, I know what they know is that you didn't want um, any living or non-living uh, entities to get jealous and to so you said pupuka so they weren't going to be coming after your baby and so um and I understand about calling a baby because you're relating it to an English word of ugly and you think you're calling the baby ugly but this really was something that we did just call the baby pupuka <laughs> so the baby would be safe keep the baby safe yeah. good 
I think it kind of also goes along with a lot of practices that, you know, aren't seen very often um, that were done in order to pale the keiki too. So like that includes like kapa ino. And so sometimes, you know, you look in your mo'oku hall and you see really odd names. And sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, why would you ever name your keiki that? But, um, you know, like in, in, in a lot of instances, it was done in order to, again, pale the keiki from entities like that. And so um, there, there are a lot of, you know, um, practices in order to um, be that pale because, you know, in, in Manao, Hawaii, when kiki are, are really young, they're really, I mean, and, you know, just in general, we know that, that the young ones are really sensitive because they're closer to, to po um, when they, you know, kahia puka maika po, so they're really close to po. And so <clears throat> even things like, you know, like swaddling, Pepe and like kapa ola in order to pale from from living and non living um, um, I don't know entities risk. yeah entities like I don't want to yeah you know <laughs> and so I think a lot of that goes on I mean and I kind of back to what Anake Kaiu was saying about like how we are like looking elsewhere for to solve our to solve things that we already have answers for and so some of that is like even you know I know people will ingest placenta in order to improve postpartum mood um but you know a link that's kind of missing um now is just the the overall postpartum care and so you know because before we we were so heavy on postpartum care like like you know the stories that like I was talking about like that my tutu tells about how she never had to worry about a thing and her mother-in-law made her stay in bed for weeks and like would not let her move and she was just fed and baby was taken care of unless baby had to eat and so things like that like that that is the real medicine and so um you know and obviously we live in a capitalist society and so a lot of that is not really um accessible to most people anymore but we still see like the the remnants of that you know you still have your ohana coming over and and you know bringing you food and bringing you tea and and coming over and carrying baby to let you sleep and so those are the things that are really going to improve your postpartum mood you know um yeah <laughs> yeah mahalo nui there was a question earlier here what have you learned um either i i, I don't I don't want to read too much into the question, but what have you learned around miscarriages, whether it's prevention or care after care? Um, what ha what do our traditions tell us about miscarriages? I um maybe I could start and Kail you could follow. Um, one thing that's really I I'd say is important that I would love for the lahui to embrace strongly is the mo'olelo that um, that a miscarriage is is the repeating of the story of haloa and it's important not just okay but important for us to acknowledge the child who has passed to embrace the family and the loss to include especially fathers in the processing of the miscarriage um, and to make sure that no wahine, no woman, no mother, no birthing family member feels responsible or guilty for the miscarriage. And I think that um, it's been very normal for people to be quiet and shame and secretive about it. Um, but I think, uh, the most powerful thing that we can do as ohana is to make sure that we acknowledge. Um, and um, so that's on, on, the, on the ohana, the, the vibration of the ohana side. I, I, on the other side, as far as physicality um, and la'o um, I, I a miscarriage is a birth. And so it's important to treat your body with the la'o that you would need in any birth. And so you're restoring your koko. So you, you, you can have um, a lye with salt. It's really good. Or if you, I'm a, I, I have my ally with orange juice. 
because it helps to um, absorb it. But whatever, however you get the alai in your body, that's my kai. And, um, and to bind your opu or to make sure that you have heat um, and to make sure you have rest, make sure that you're having all of the liquids that you need, make sure that you're processing that flushing. So mamaki tea can help you to flush anything out of your body. So just like giving birth, you want to be able to help your body to have those restorative process. Pa'akai and alaya to me are the most important, um, but all of all of the regular la'au that come after giving birth are, are applicable. And then um, the other part of the la'au, you know, we're talking, people are asking on this Zoom chat about a la'au, what do you do? Which la'au do you use? La'au is only... 10% plant and 90% pule. And so, yes, pa'akai and alai are good for your iron restoration and to make sure your koko is strong. Pule is the most important thing that you can do um, after a miscarriage. So making sure that all of your pule are processing, helping you to process and to connect to those elements that you need to connect to. So um, one thing that... Um, having had several miscarriages myself, I can say that there are times when I have felt the absolute presence of the soul and the passing of that soul to the point where in my prayers, when I bless my children, that child is one of the children blessed. And I have other had other miscarriages where I didn't have that same feeling. It was sort of like cellular and more like a vaimakalehua and the ho'oku'u was the ho'oku'u and I never had to visit that again. And so I'm sharing that. That's a very, very private thing that I've just shared publicly. <laughs> um, but I, I, I share that because I've over the years had many women and men, particularly fathers, come to me with so much eha, so much pain, not knowing how to process. And I share that about the different kinds of miscarriages that I've experienced as a cultural practitioner, as a birth worker, as someone who has researched cultural practice, that every birth is different. Every miscarriage is different. Every ohana is different. Every woman is different at a different time in her life. And so how I gave birth six years ago was different than how I gave birth 24 years ago. Um, and so that's what I have to share about a miscarriage. Mahalo for sharing, Puni. Thanks. Um, Puni did a great job. I don't have that much to add, except that we, you know, just so few that I've worked with, the, the same la'al that we use after giving birth is some of the same products that you're going to be using because you're still wanting to strengthen the body. You're still wanting to give something that's going to help with the spiritual and the mental in the body and then paying attention to the food and the support that they're going to have, I think are some of the most important things we've seen. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, right. Earlier, Ka'ia, you mentioned that there's a, a practice that takes place approximately three days after birth um, and, you know, you, you briefly touched on it just now, where um, uh, different la'au needs to be gathered. And can you, again, without giving away the recipe, because uh, maybe you can tell us how you learned about this practice, and then um, with the importance, and the name of it, and the, because people can do, can do homework, yeah, uh, just as you did, um, and the importance of this practice. Sure. Um, so when we first started doing our research, Apuhala was, I think the first time I saw it was maybe in Malcolm Chun's or, or Jane Gutmanis. I keep meaning to go back and to, to read where it was, but it came up a couple of times. There were just some mentions of, um, you know, the hala or the ko or the neo, so some of the, the items that were in it, but it, it didn't give any recipes. It didn't have any exact things. And so, um, you know, as we were reading it, it was just something that, yeah, I want to know what this is. I've seen this, you know, what is this, this la'al, this medicine that women are supposed to use after birth? Um, uh, and it did say that it was a ni'ihau um, thing. So I think I was in Pua Kea's 
language class at that time. I can't remember. We were talking about it and I had told, I was talking about it to him and told him that it was something I really wanted to learn about. And then many years later, uh, Ipo Wong did a presentation as part of the Olelo Hawaii, something up at, at campus. And she did it all in Hawaiian. And um, with, I think it was Auntie Lolena was with her. And so they talked about it and the, her father, um, you know, just the practice on Niihau and what he did. And I had uh, Malia Nobriga sitting with me. She was helping me because I didn't, you know, I, I'm not fluent, so I couldn't understand quite all of it. And then the nephew actually showed, she did a little demonstration on how to make it. So I talked to Ipa Wong and I, we told her about our practitioners class that we were, we were doing trainings at that time for practitioners because the class that Puni and I do, we were hoping that, you know, we could train so that there would be more people doing the class. And so anyway, we were having a training. We invited her to come over and she came over and she shared it with us. And but she did share that her family wasn't quite ready for it to just, you know, to be um announced or taught or whatever, just all over the place that she was giving us this really special gift of passing down this knowledge. And so for us, we understood that the same integrity, the same respect, the same malama of this, this practice was being given to us, but we need to hold it and we need to teach it in the exact same way. And so as we started having classes, um, like I was saying earlier, they, they have to come to us on the third day. And if you think about giving birth in a hospital, you know, usually it's about the third day you're going home. So we're saying, you know, in Western medicine, you just drive up to the pharmacy and you give them your, your prescription and then you come home with your medicine. And that's not what we're saying at all. And, and believe me, some people have thought that that's what they do. Like, oh, we gave birth, we'll come pick it up. And we're like, no, you, here's the things you need to help gather. You need to show up. Um, and the thing for us is that, you know, we're dedicated to the practice. And so if you give birth on a Thursday afternoon, that means we show up on Saturday. And if you give birth on a Friday afternoon, you show up on Sunday. And so we were always making sure there was someone available when we knew that our classes, because even if it was on a weekend or on a holiday, we were showing up to help them make it because we believed in this practice. And so from something that was just, and for many children, like Puni is one of them, I mean, for many moms um, that had babies without taking this la'au and then took it with another baby, they could tell the difference in their body. They could, um, they felt better there, you know, and on the third day, sometimes as adrenaline comes down and, and, you know, it's real life is here and you have this baby and you you kind of need this um, lift. Uh, this is something else that La'au does. It helps to heal your your insides. It helps to bring the milk in. Um, it's the parents do it together in a quiet time. So, you know, after all of that going on with giving birth, there's a space for them to reconnect and to, to be in touch with each other. So the La'au does, you know, a lot of things for you. And so, when we started, it was just a word in the book that we knew about. And um, as of today, I think we've made help 72 couples with this law after birth, but we've never written it down. It's not going to be in our curriculum. You want to learn and you can come, uh, you know, learn from us face to face. And we try and instill in them the same integrity and respect and caring for the practice. And we also let them know that this is their kuleana now that they can help any of their family members, but it's not theirs to go out and teach. Great. Thank you for sharing just a little bit about the apuhala. And, um, you know, I have that personal experience too. I might, it wasn't from a birth of my own, but um, my fourth mo'opuno was born about 10 or 11 days late. And unfortunately, his father, my son-in-law, had to uh, take a trip, an international trip on the very night <laughs> that he was born. So uh, three days later, who do you think showed up in the back of Kalihi Valley to, you know, with as many ingredients ingredients as I could gather before I got there to make the apuhala for this mo'opuna. So um, mahalo for making yourselves available, especially when I didn't even know what was what was coming because I wasn't in your class. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
Yeah, awesome. Um, I want to let the viewers know that we see your comments. And even if you've been leaving them on Facebook or on YouTube, we see your comments. Mahalo for sharing your stories. Mahalo for sharing your mana'o. We're really grateful. And, um, and we're trying to go through all of the questions that you've been asking. So we are um, really grateful that there's so much Ike out there and we have a lot to learn from you as well. And grateful to Wahine Hula Puni and Kaiolani. So we're not finished yet. I'm just saying thank you for those that are watching. Do have a question from uh, somebody who left a comment on YouTube, and it's about specific locations uh, for childbirth, such as on Oahu Kukani Loko or Kulahaloa on Molokai. Oh, are the hana are the hanao of specific chiefs born there somehow related to those akua? And is that the akua that are attached to those places? Perhaps the the asker is making the point. Do you have any thoughts about specific places related to childbirth? Wahine Hula, I see you smiling. I think you should answer. <laughs> I see you squirming. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to think about, you know, they're so eloquent. So I'm trying to think before I speak. Um, yeah, I mean, there are many different um, sites across of Hawaii that are known and attached to the Mana'o of Hano. And there are many places that are not so well known. Um, and so in, uh, you know, there, there are specific areas like Kukani Loko where, um, how do I explain this? There's a certain amount of mana attached to those places. And so there are certain people who were allowed, I guess I would say allowed, um, to Hano over there because of their certain mana i guess um and then there are places um in the back of valleys where there's a pohaku hanau where um you know people from that valley um and on different i guess levels of mana um we're allowed to hanau um <clears throat> and so i think it's hard to like group them all together into one however um it goes along with the with the manao that um practices are very geographical as well and so in certain on certain mokupuni only certain allow um ranking people were allowed to give birth in certain places but in certain valleys all everybody was allowed to give birth in certain places or in certain ohana only their ohana is allowed to hanao in on that pohaku or in this place and so um <clears throat> I think it really solidifies again that manao or that that idea that how how important um, aina and hano and the, and that connection is. Um, but yeah, keeping in mind that that everywhere is different. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and maybe the maybe a better one to answer is what is the significance of place for for childbirth for hanau? Any thoughts, Puni or Kaiu? I really love what you said, uh, Wahine Hula. I think, and I think thinking about what is, what, I, you used the word allowed awkwardly and shyly and and appropriately. <laughs> I think it's really it, it is uh, the the importance of place really takes that um, that conversation to another another place. Um, this idea that your mana or your genealogy or the kulana that you hold in your your life um, traditionally would have been associated with where 
you were born and it, you would be designed often in a certain family or tradition or generation to be born in a specific place because you carry a particular kuleana. Um, so there is that really what you're saying, Kim, about what is the role of place um, in a birth. We have these old stories that tie a place, a particular place to a very high ranking person. And um, uh, rank, meaning they have lots of mana and also that they have lots of kuleana and that they have the social network to be able to train them to carry the kuleana that comes with being born in that place. And so I think that that's an important part of the allowing because um, nowadays we could allow ourselves to do all kinds of stuff that could be pretty dangerous if we're not <laughs> equipped with the social network to be able to help us to carry the kuleana that comes with being born in a certain place. And I love, love the stories of small communities that had birthing stones um, because we can make those kinds of places available again. We can re- a sign within our family networks that this is the best place for our family to give birth because we have the social network alive in past and the physical network of mana and resource to be able to give birth in a specific place. Um, many people perceive um, uh, home birthing or you know giving birth kind of on the aina or in community as this romantic luxury and um and it is the same in in so many ways that a child that is born specific to a vahipana has a relationship and a kuleana to that place and that's why hawaiians give birth at home that's why hawaiians give birth on one hanau aina kulaivi it's the same reason why we plant our ieve. It's the same reason why we plant our bones in those places. <clears throat> and so I think um, if you have the opportunity to give birth in a space that gives mana to your genealogy, that is appropriate to your genealogy, and it is supported by the social network that you're born into or that you're bringing your children into, then um, that's the hope for the next generation. Give birth in your mother's living room, give birth in your bedrooms, give birth in your yard, give birth next to a fire at your tutu's house and all of the ways that you can perpetuate the mana that is yours to care for. And then also on that story of mana, um, there's a field of people. There's some people who were raised that are hungry for mana that they cannot carry, mana that they're, they just want to amass mana like wealth, like money in a bank or something. Don't be one of those people. Try your best to take care of the mana that is yours. Build your own capacity to carry kuleana. And when you're able to awamo, then your next generation is going to be able to carry mana even better. And you continue to grow that mana the same way. When we're ready to reinvigorate those places that have the strongest mana for birthing, then I'm, you know, I'm excited for that moment. What I see today in this generation is that we are not at all ready. Um, and that we have to put mana the aina, make those aina that we do have access to strong with our own birthing stories, with our own ieve, with our own ivi. So that the mana that we're growing right now is going to last for many, many, many more generations and start to feed the lahui. That's why we do it. Not because we want mana just for ourselves. Not because it's this romantic thing that is super cool and super kue. We're doing it because we're responsible for the mana for the following generations. Beautifully said. Thank you so much. Um, given that discussion on place, we have, as you can imagine, questions from those Poe uh, Hawaii who are not here in the islands, uh, who are away. Do you have any mana'o for those folks who um, who are attached to who they are, but may not be here in Hawaii? Nei?
you know, we get, um, we do, we are contact, contacted from people in, in the States quite often that they, you know, they, their way, they're, they're birthing, what can they do? And they can do some of the same things that they would do over here. They could eat their cultural foods. They could practice Lomi. They can um, learn what the practices were in their family. They can start, you know, really talking to their family and, and thinking about how they're going to raise this child. What are the, what is their spirituality? What is their concept of cultural traditions? What are they going to practice in their house? How are they going to, you know, be the ones that are going to, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, bring back or uh, bring back practice, whatever, but what are they going to be doing, not just for the birth, but into the future that they're keeping connected to all of these practices that they are going to continue them in their family. And so part of it will be learning things. Part of it will be remembering things. Part of it will be talking to their family, but some of these very same practices that we're talking about, they can do them over there, but they have to learn what's in their family and, and what, but for me, the real intent is not just for the birth. It's like, if you're going to be living, you know, away from Hawaii, how do you continue? How do you instill these things into your children as, as they grow up so that, you know, they're born on a, an Aina A, so they, they, how do you instill it into them? You know, my daughter lives in Vegas and um, I go over there and visit and, it's hard. Like there's a lot of Hawaiians over there and they want so badly to be connected, but just that physical distance is often sometimes a barrier. And so um, I'm constant, you know, I walked into the house and my granddaughter was like, hola punas. And I'm like, what she said? She's like, she said hi to you in Spanish. I'm like, heck no, where's all our Hawaiian books? I'm taking all my Hawaiian books over the next time. But you know what I mean? It's got to be a, a conscious effort when you're that far away. And I can see that when I go over there is that, um, you know, they have hula and they have all of these things, but it's not just those things. It's the day-to-day -day living that you're instilling in your households while you're away as, as your children grow and for, for childbirth. Great. I hope that's reassuring to one person asked, but there may be others thinking, thinking that as well. So great answer. Mahalo Nui. We have about uh, 15 more minutes left in this session, and we welcome your questions. Again, I several of you are sharing your mana'o, and thank you so much. Know that all of the panelists have access, even when it's coming over on YouTube or Facebook, that we are reading your comments, and we're grateful for your stories as well. Um, here is a question. Were there, oh, la'au, lapa'au, or practices that were used uh, for high blood pressure during pregnancy, during the hapai phase? Um, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> but none that I would say on Facebook or Zoom. <laughs> so there are practices. There is la'au that, um, that can... Uh, can uh i have had uh, moms that i've helped that have had uh, high blood pressure and we use um lao that we grow here and actually that particular lao grows everywhere in the world and um and it's just a tea and you're, you're sort of like taking that tea regular and then regulating and, and monitoring i won't be sharing the name of that plant here um uh, courtney uh or uluvehi if oh, you want to um if you want to email the birthing a nation and we can have a kuka, then that's really important. Every every lao lapa'o interaction, especially with pregnant women, we want to be able to tell the whole story. And so we're, we're really mindful that we understand like, where are you at in your practice? Where are you at in your, you know, nohona? Where are you at in your pule? Um, you know, what island are you pulling forward for yourself? Where are you going? Um, and all of that is part of a very um, lengthy and intentional interview. And after everything is pa, then um, we we off, here at Holu Aina anyway in Kalihi Valley, we harvest that la'au together and we learn how to process it. And then uh, that practice becomes um, the practice for that makuahine or for that ohana. 
Um, in the case of a pregnant woman or a pregnant person, or even someone who is like dealing with very severe illnesses, sometimes you also want a kahu to be able, like a family member who is there to kind of help you, to support you, a kako'o, and, um, and we, we go through that practice. But the uh, a high blood pressure, definitely there's a, a very simple um, tea that, that, that we make that, you know, it's guaranteed growing in your yard. Um, it's, and so, but, I, but I, like I said, I won't share that um, publicly and I wouldn't have actually give any la'au lapa'au recipe uh, without having that kuka first, especially if it has to do with a pregnant person um, or, or, you know, high blood pressure can, can be something that's really difficult. Um, one thing that I can share, though, that um, that is really nice for uh, pregnant people who are suffering uh, with um, high blood pressure is that if you're able to sit in the ocean or sit in the tide pools from time to time, that that can really help uh, help you um, to regulate and to to um, make ease, make more ease ease of the ways that your body is responding to the stress of a new baby and with the high blood pressure. Um, yeah. And I can just add that if you really go back to all of your cultural foods and really focus on um, nothing processed, nothing American, that that's also going to help bring down your blood pressure. And that's mm -hmm. for all times, right? Not just during your pregnancy, mm -hmm. but just in general, reduce processed foods. Did we get to talk enough about diet during, um, during uh, Hapai and Hanau, cut you? I mean, I can always talk about diet, but I do, <laughs> <laughs> there's other things on there. Um, I think that, um, yeah, like I said, that what we're creating taste for generations, but I will say that for many of our couples that come in, when we can talk about diet from a cultural lens and from a lens of understanding that our foods were all kinolaw forms of our, our many akua that let us, you know, that connected us to our environment and and um, and the way that we look at foods, like it really creates a shift in our couples. And so the wanting to have more cultural foods and, and making it easy for them. And so it's not like you have to, I mean, we give them a menu that says, you know, may have a limu omelet for breakfast or maybe some oatmeal with some coconut milk and uh, kalo and uala or make um a kalo patty with a little bit of fish and kalo, but ways in which to eat the foods. And so if we can make it something easily and doable where they're just incorporating, but I will say that, you know, and I was talking to this, uh, the women about eating more cultural carbohydrates and taking out all of the white carbohydrates from their diet while they were pregnant. And one of the um, mothers in there, she, the, the husband was telling everybody he goes yep what she's saying is right because he wears a continual glucose monitor and he says when he eats his kalo and wal and ulu that his blood sugars go up very little but as soon as he eats rice or white bread or something like like that they really shoot up very very high and so the more that they can just really eat foods that connect them to their spirit, to connect them to their kupuna is better off for them throughout their pregnancy. But we have to do it in ways that are, are doable because most of our families are busy. You've got two families working. Um, but And then teaching them a little bit about the foods. One of the questions we get all the time is, can we have cooking classes? Or, you know, can where's the recipe book? All of these kind of things. And we just try to help them to understand that they're the foods that are culturally important to us are the best foods for them to be eating when they're pregnant, but not just that, again, after the children are born and so on. And so we do have a lot of them that, um, you know, start planting foods or they're sharing recipes with each other. One of the things that we do for our classes is we cook food for the first couple of days, um, the first couple of classes, and then we pair uh, couples up for the next classes. And, and just one, one class for the whole nine week series, you're responsible with another couple to, um, to make food for everybody. And we tell them it doesn't have to be fancy, just needs to be ipono. And, um, you know, if it can have cultural things to it. And they really outdo themselves in trying <laughs> to provide a meal that's just beautiful, that's filled with their mana and their aloha. And um, 
And that in itself helps to bring them to a different level of understanding about the mana that you put in food and what you're feeding people. And when you're pregnant, what this can do for your body. I don't know. I'm not sure what else you want to talk about when it comes to food. Well, it's so important just to keep healthy in general, right? And I know we didn't ask specific questions about food, but but nutrition always pops up, right? Ipono always emerges because it's so important to our uh, well-being, just in general, holistic well-being. Yeah. Um, well, on the subject of diet, one person is asking, how how's about raw fish during pregnancy? Yes or no, or it depends. I understand why they're doing it. Um, first of all, all of the big fish, they uh, were, fish aren't the same as they were many, many years ago, right? Because our oceans aren't the same as they were many, many years ago. So when you're talking about some of the bigger fish and the things like mercury and all those higher, they have a higher content because a lot of them are eating fish. So what I, I, I ate raw fish throughout both of my pregnancies, but what I try and tell women now, the smaller the fish are, the better they are for you. So go ahead and eat whatever fish you want during pregnancy, but the smaller fish, the ones that eat limu, these are the ones that you want to be sticking to. The bigger fish, they're out in the open where you don't know where they were. And then if for any reason your immune system is down or is low, then that's when you want to be careful. And that I actually... um, learn through working with HIV patients is some of when their uh, immune systems were down and they had raw fish. Like I had one client that actually the the little, this is going to sound gross, but anyway, the little worms in the fish multiplied in their stomach because they didn't have anything to take care of it within their immune system. And so that was one of the reasons they weren't eating. So um, that's my advice to most women is, is stay away from the, the big fish, especially if it's raw, you want to stick to the smaller fish. And again, if your immune system, if, it, if it's not working the, at the best, then you want to be a little bit careful. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think we can get to this last question. Um, can ho'ailona or signs in the weather or birthing atmosphere affect or determine the mana that a pepe will have? I, I'd love to answer that one. Everything affects the mana of the pepe. <laughs> <laughs> what the dreams you're having, the weather, the how the clouds are forming, where you are, what's happening in politics, what's happening in your ohana, all of it, every part of it affects your baby, affects the family. It's all connected. And there was another question earlier about akua. I love the idea that our akua are our environment. And so when you're, the reason why we're, pl- tracking ho'ailona is because we're we're tracking the sacredness of our environment that we are descendant of so the idea that akua is um is the separate thing or that ho'ailona is the separate thing that's not a hawaiian thought the hawaiian thought is i am the clouds i am born of the stars the earth the soil all of that is my body. And so when my baby is born, all of those elements that are all around me, whether that's the weather or whether that's, you know, how how safe the water is to drink, all of it is connected to the mana that my baby will carry. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go around and ask for some final thoughts from each of you, please. We're so grateful that you're here to talk about our traditions, our beliefs, our practices around Hapai and Hanau. And I hope that uh, not only young families who are paying attention to this, but really all families, all members of all families, I think we've we've all learned so much here. So um, let's go to Maui, to Waiohuli, Wahine Hula. Do you have some some thoughts that you want to leave with the listeners? Yeah. Um, well, mahalo nui again for this opportunity. I'm so honored to share space with these amazing wahine. Um, but I guess I would like to leave with, um, like I always say, just 
my maka'u and my hila hila um, about like where you're at in your in your journey of remembering um, our cultural practices, especially surrounding birth. Um, you know, look inward, look into your ohana, um, reach out to the resources that you have around you, um, and you know meet yourself where you're at so don't feel like you have to do all of the things and like you know go all out and like again that's adding stress which is you know not what we want um meet yourself where you're at and the you know the the most important and the biggest things that are um that our kupuna have left us is what exactly what my kipuni was talking about was you know the the aloha part of it all um and so if you know if you're gonna start anywhere, it's it's that it's that internal work. Um, it's that um, making sure that you're you're my cut you with yourself and um, you know build building that connection with your kupuna in that way and then moving forward from that. Um, so yeah. Beautiful. Wahine hula mahalo nui. Um well you two decide who's next. Your closing closing thoughts you want to leave with our with our listeners, our viewers. I'll go next since we're going in age order. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. Gonna... <laughs> How do you get close? Cut you. Um, I I just uh, I I am thinking about my friend Pelika who taught me that um, mana is faith. And I just really love that concept. Um, when I was giving birth, there's there are often the moments that I felt like a doubt. I felt alone or I felt scared. And to feel that I have could have faith in my kupuna, that I could have faith in the love of my family, that I could have faith in the aina that, and the elements that are surrounding me, that that, that that is the mana that I I kind of draw on and I I would like I would like everyone to kind of have that moment when um, whenever I have that doubtful moment um I remember this last birth uh my friend Laura leaned over and she said you're doing it <laughs> you're doing it and um Lori my midwife she's she's like you're doing it and so the same with our lahui as we're giving birth to all of this, these, this mana for all of us, you know, as we're giving birth to our movements, to our generations, to um, new ways of being. I feel like that's the faith uh, that, that we need to apply, that we are doing it, you know. We are doing um, it. Beautiful. We're doing it. Mahalo, Puni. Cut you. I just want to say mahalo to everyone. Um, Vahine Hula, you give such great hopes. To, you know all the work that that we started I just I really love hearing just the way that you're thinking and the way that you're putting into practice you know all of these things and um Kim Mahalo for supporting us for all these years and um I love you guys shout out to Cami who I know is up there listening to all of us because she's been an integral part of our journey um in fact our curriculum she uh, it was her vocabulary list that's in our our curriculum now and she one of her things was to go through the dictionary right and to find all the Hawaiian words around birthing and we still um use that today and um to my friend Puni and for all of our journey you know when we first started this we had no idea like who thought we'd be on a webinar talking about this, you know, when we started all these years ago. But um, I can say that uh, the work that we're doing, that we see, we see the growth of the, the different, um, just the different couples, the different classes, and we can see the growth of the Lahui and just the, the intentfulness in which they're now paying attention to birthing, which, you know, has has moved has the dial has shifted since we started and that's what I think is so important and that um you know I love what uh Fahini Hula said don't be scared like we just were everyone thinks that they have to be perfect in all of these things and they don't you know talking just remembering your own birth story and starting from there one of the things we ask our couples is how many of you know your own birth story and many of them don't and so um, as we move forward and really trying to 
have a healthier nation, have a healthier Lahui. It begins with, you know, some of the things and the practices that we're talking about. So um, we just, we love our work. We love all of you that were out there listening. Thank you for, for joining in and um, just thank everybody for the work that, and being part of all of this work because we, we don't do it alone. We do it with the support of everyone. Mahalo nui to all of you, Wahine Hula, to Puni, to Kaiolani. We're grateful to all three of you for participating this evening and really opening up, sharing all of this EK with a much broader audience. I think that will definitely grow. Ho'ululahui. So mahalo nui. Mahalo to our host, Hawaii Ponoi Coalition, who presents Hawaiian History Month uh, for this particular session in uh, Ho'ola Week. Uh, if you're listening to this live, you know that Ho'ola Week is not over yet, so please go to uh, hawaiianhistorymonth.org and sign up for other really awesome programming uh, that Hawaiian History Month is presenting. We have many sponsors and partners, Mahalo Nui to Kamehameha Schools, the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, Papa'ola Lokahi, UH Department of Native Hawaiian Health at the Johnny Burns School of Medicine, to Ahahui Onakoka, the Association of Native Hawaiian and physicians, to the Center for Biographical Research, also at UH Manoa, Hawaii Nui Akea School of Hawaiian Knowledge, the Department of Theater and Dance, also at UH Manoa, Hawaii Youth Opera Chorus, Olelo Community Media, and to OEV Television, Mahalo Nui, and to all of our Cross Post partners and other partners who have been um, a part of the planning for uh, Hawaiian History Month 2002, Mahalo to all all of you. On behalf of Ho'ola Week at Hawaiian History Month, my name is Kim Ku'ule Bernie. I want to thank you all for tuning in and please stay with all the programming this month because we're really excited to present it to you. Aloha, ahui ho. Mahalo for all your kind comments. We did read them, I promise, and we'll be looking uh, over them. We'll be reviewing them again later. Mahalo.